So hi everyone. Uh, this is the uh, penultimate fishbowl seminar for this semester. We have one more last week. And our speaker today is Professor Sachin Kati from the Computer Science Department at Stanford University. Sachin has been very active on the system side of networking. In particular, uh, during his PhD, he worked uh, on network coding, for example. And more recently, he has been working on full duplex wireless. He's been uh, uh, very successful at what he does, receiving several awards, starting from a dissertation award to many awards recently, including the NSF Career Award, as well as uh, the Okawa, Hoover, and Packard Fellowships recently. So please welcome Professor Sachin Kati. Uh, thanks, Shreeva. Uh, so, shall I get started now? Yes, please. Go ahead. All right. Thanks. So today I'm going to talk about a topic uh, which I call radio coexistence. But uh, the way to think about this problem is uh, radio density is increasing in space and frequency. Right. So we are all carrying around devices, for example, your smartphones that have lots of radios on them, from Bluetooth to Wi-Fi, 3G, LTE, so on. And your homes, for example, now have multiple devices with Wi-Fi interfaces, cellular interfaces, and so on. And the same kind of densification in both space and frequency is happening across the infrastructure. So multiple networks are co-located, small cells are being deployed, heterogeneous networks are being deployed. So there's an increasing density that of radios using the same space and frequency. So the challenge with such a dense deployment of radios is how would they coexist? And this kind of demand for connectivity has spurred the popular popularity of these unlicensed wireless devices. And today I'm going to talk about this coexistence problem in the context of unlicensed spectrum, like the 2.45 gigahertz spectrum. But the techniques kind of I will develop today are uh, more general and they can apply to cellular networks too, as I'll talk about later uh, in the talk. So let's take an example. So this is kind of a typical scenario, right? So Take your ISM band, this is between 2.4 and 2.5 gigahertz, so you have 100 megahertz of unlicensed band. Seems like a lot. But the problem is this, there's a tremendous amount of devices and there's a tremendous amount of different kinds of protocols uh, that are being deployed in the spectrum, often in the same geographic area or in the same home. So here's an example where you have a ZigBee-based hot monitor, for example, and you have Wi-Fi-based devices like your phone. They're mm -hmm. occupying different bands. Uh, you might even have legacy devices like your microwave oven, which emit radiation in the same frequency band. So the result of this density of radios and protocols in space is that uh, these coexisting, coexisting networks share arbitrary fragments of this available spectrum. And what's the problem with this? So the problem this is, with this is that current radios are kind of designed to operate on a single contiguous band of spectrum. Right? So let's take your Wi-Fi AP and your Wi-Fi laptop, for example. And let's assume these other coexisting radios have been deployed, microwave ovens, Zigbee, and another Wi-Fi interpreter. So how would this Wi-Fi AP operate? This Wi-Fi AP would actually have to pick one of those unused spectrum fragments. So it might pick, for example, the first one, channel one, and that's the only bandwidth it can use. But as you can see, there's a lot of unused available spectrum fragments that go, uh, that go waste. And if instead you could design radios that could use all of this spectrum, then you could get much higher throughput, more robust, uh, higher capacity performance. So the thesis for this talk, and this, this talk, this, this work actually was done by three of my students, Dinesh, Steven, and Jeff. And they have been looking at the problem of how can we design future wireless networks to coexist gracefully in such interference-ridden and fragmented spectrum. That's the problem statement. So in this talk, I'll talk about two things. So this will kind of be an architecture for wireless area networks to coexist gracefully with interference in the same band. And this will consist of two big contributions. So one is a paper which we published in SIGCOM 2011. And this paper first built a mechanism to kind of discover the nature of local interfering radio. So the way to think about this is, we want to build a system and algorithm that allows any radio to kind of know what its RF neighborhood looks like. What are the other interfering radios? What spectrum are they occupying? What angles their signals are coming at? And so on. So this is an information plane for RF uh, around your neighborhood. And the second is a, a new radio design that kind of exploits this earlier mechanism that understands the nature of the RF interference around it. And Stitches together whatever spectrum fragments are left over into one big pipe, into a fatter pipe, and thus leverages all the fragmented spectrum. 
And this is a paper that is published in SICOM 2012, that is last year. So first let me talk about uh, the mechanism to discover the nature of local interfering data. So you might be wondering, okay, there are lots of mechanisms to kind of sense the medium, right? Ultimately that's what I'm doing. For example, classically CSMA exists, which is more an energy-based technique. So it's, the idea is that you would sense the signal on the medium, and if it's above a particular threshold, then you would declare that the medium is occupied in that particular frequency band. But these mechanisms are blind, right? So they're unable to identify radio types. They cannot tell, for example, that the interfering radio is another Wi-Fi radio, or the interfering radio is a microwave oven or a Zigbee radio. So that's one problem. And we'll see why that, that identifying the radio type of the interferer is useful. Uh, the second problem is this CSMA is very sensitive uh, to signal strength, right? Because we're ultimately looking at how much energy is there in the time. And this suffers when the signals are weak. For example, if it's a Zigbee radio that transmits at much lower power, you might not even detect it. Uh, you might not even detect it, but uh, the Wi-Fi radio would ignore that and transmit and interfere with that CB radio. So here's an example of that. It's a very sensitive device. So it's a Zigbee device. Uh, let's say it's a heart monitoring uh, medical application. And since your Wi-Fi radio is far away, it might end up not detecting that Zigbee radio and interfering with it. And this, this is why energy-based sensing mechanisms tend to fail and are not very robust. The other extreme approach is kind of to build decoders for every type of signal, right? So if you want to build a sensing, uh, kind of a spectrum analyzer, let me call it, uh, you could put a, put a decoder for a Zigbee preambles, for Wi-Fi preambles, and perhaps for other signals like Bluetooth. But this obviously does not scale because it's going to be expensive and complex to put all of this uh, uh, processing circuitry in every radio. And second, if there's a new type of interference, if there's a new protocol that's deployed, then this obviously won't work uh, for that, uh, that signal. So there's no systematic mechanism for radios of kind of different types, different protocols to coexist with each other. So what this work is trying to do is kind of build a local wireless information plane. And what we are, this is going to be deployed in the smart Wi-Fi AT in this picture. So here's what it provides. It provides knowledge of what radio types are operating in the local vicinity. So it will tell you whether there's a Wi-Fi interferer, whether there's a Zigbee interferer, or whether there's a microwave oven interferer in your neighborhood. Second, it will tell you what spectrum each of these interfering radios is occupying. So in to look at, the, for example, the 100 megahertz bandwidth in the ISM band, and it will tell you what spectrum fragments are being occupied by these interferers. And finally, it will also tell you what are the spatial directions of these interfering signals. So it will tell you that the Wi-Fi AP interferer signal is arriving at 45 degrees, and Zigbee is arriving at 60 degrees. And one way to leverage kind of this Kind of information is obviously for like beam forming or spatial uh, kind of RF beam forming kind of applications, as well as things like localizing where that interfering radio is located in your network. So in this talk, I'll kind of just uh, give you a hint about the first two aspects. I won't talk about how you detect the angle of arrival of these interfering signals, uh, but I'd refer you to the paper if you if you are interested and happy to take any questions about uh, that aspect. So how well does this work? And uh, as I'll show later, uh, we developed a technique that's very robust to low SMRs. So one of the challenges with such an environment is you cannot assume that the interfering signal will appear at a very high SMR at the receiver where you're trying to detect it. So it, it, it has to work at very low SMRs. And second, by definition, since it is interference, there could be multiple overlapping signals, including your own signal. So you need to be able to tease out all of these interferers even in the presence of such interference. And finally, we want to build something with low complexity, right? So we do not want to kind of uh, do decoding and so on, but uh, we want to build something that's general and low complexity and operate from raw IQ samples. Uh, does not need any kind of signal processing before being able to detect. So here's the high-level architecture. We call the system DOS. Uh, you'll see that in the top block there. Uh, and I, the name came from this uh, thought of, it stands for degrees of freedom. So the system is really detecting what degrees of freedom in this RF uh, space are being used by other interfering radios. So the idea is this is the architecture. This is how the system mechanically works. Uh, on, on the smart Wi-Fi AP, what it's doing is it's uh, 
getting that signal and converting it into a raw IQ stream uh, through the ADC. Uh, the first step is kind of a feature extraction step. So if this is directly of the raw IQ, you kind of extract features that allow you to classify uh, what signal type it is, what radio type it is. And then after those feature vectors are computed and you kind of know the radio type, uh, you split it off into two branches. And one of the branch computes uh, what spectrum is being used by this interfering radio, and the other branch computes what angle of arrival this interfering radio is coming at. And this whole block, this whole information plane, kind of acts as a substrate for higher layer, higher layer protocols such as the MAC protocol. So the MAC protocol can, can use this information to decide things like which channel to use, what spectrum to use, uh, how to schedule different transmissions, and so on. So that's decoupled. So this is kind of the information plane on which, on top of which, this uh, medium access control works. So uh, I just repeated the same thing. So raw samples are processed to extract feature vectors, and the feature vectors kind of allow you to detect all three things: signal size, spectral occupancy, and spatial direction. So let's let's look at the feature extraction step. So how what what is our key insight in this uh, feature extraction step? So the basic idea is that if you look at any man-made signal, uh, whether it is Wi-Fi, Zigbee, or Bluetooth. There are hidden repeating patterns that are unique and necessary for the operation of that protocol. So, for example, in Wi-Fi, you have a stream of OFTM symbols, and each OFTM symbol will have a cyclic basic that repeats at a fixed interval. And that fixed interval is dependent on the bandwidth of that, that particular channel or particular Wi-Fi implementation is using. Similarly, if you look at Zigbee, there's a pulse over which you modulate data. And that pulse is obviously repeating at the same rate as the as the baud rate of the sum or the or the symbol rate of that underlying system. And if you look at across all these protocols, whether it's Bluetooth, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, whatnot, you always will find these hidden repeating patterns. So this pattern will not be apparent. Sometimes it, it's not like a bit pattern that's repeating. It's a, a, it could be something one layer below. It could be a pulse. It could be something like a cyclic basic on top of which you might be modulating different kinds of data. But you'll always find this kind of repeating uh, pattern in many of these man-made signals. So, how, so we leverage essentially these patterns to kind of infer the signal size and spectral occupancy. So how would we go about doing this? So the idea is that if a signal has a repeating pattern, then when you correlate the received signal against itself but delayed by a fixed amount, that correlation will peak when the delay is equal to the period at which the pattern repeats. So kind of uh, make visually makes sense, right? So you have one so this sample of received signal shifted by a little bit, and if the period is that gap, that gap between the shifted version is equal to the period at which that uh, pattern is repeating, then this correlation will pro provide a peak. So I'm not saying anything new here. This is well and well known in the signal processing world, uh, cyclic stationary analysis. So we are essentially using all that theory. So we the cyclic autocorrelation function is just well defined for a lot of functions, and here's the definition for that. And it's essentially computing the correlation of the received signal against itself at different time shifts. That so the time shift is represented by that value tau. And instead of looking at the absolute value of these time shifts, you just compute kind of the frequency. So you're essentially taking the Fourier transform of that uh, cyclic autocorrelation, uh, that shifted autocorrelation, and the frequency alpha. Is kind of the frequency at which the pattern repeats. Uh, what is the rate at which these patterns are repeating? So let's look at a real signal. This is real raw data from a Wi-Fi and a ZB transmission. And there are two axes here. So one is the delay tau, that is the shift at which uh, you see these peaks in correlation. And the other axis is this pattern frequency, the frequency at which that particular pattern repeats. So you can see that there is a very, very well discriminated set of uh, kind of peaks. So Zigbee will have peaks at particular values of tau and particular values of alpha, and Wi-Fi will have a different set of uh, tau and different set of alpha. So you can start seeing where the feature vectors are coming from, right, and why they allow you to kind of classify the signal type. Essentially, they are they're starting the fact that these patterns are repeating at different frequencies and at different shifts, and this allows you to kind of discriminate whether it's a Wi-Fi signal or a Zigbee signal. And one important point to note is that we are still operating on the raw IQ sample. I have not done any decoding. I have not processed, for example, uh, NFST or done OFTM decoding or Zigbee's decoding yet. This is just on raw IQ. So this also has several other advantages. One is it's very robust to noise because what you're essentially doing is 
you're integrating over a long time period, you're taking a repeat signal and just shifting it and essentially summing it over that long period, this tends to be very, very robust to noise because it gets averaged out very quickly. So even at very low signal strength, you can make out which signal will be, whether it's a Wi-Fi signal or a PC signal, signal for example. Question, I have a question. Yes. How long do you need to signals to distinguish them? So what we found experimentally uh, is that typically if I have like 600 microseconds worth of, of samples for an 80 megahertz signal, uh, so if, let's take the ISM bandwidth, so it's 100 megahertz bandwidth. I would capture the IQ for that 100 megahertz for around 5 to 600 microseconds. That is sufficient to kind of uh, allow this to work fairly well. And 600 microseconds is a fairly small number. For example, your Wi-Fi packets tend to be 1 to 2 milliseconds long. So this is in the sub packet uh, kind of domain. Does that make sense? But there's a big problem with this, uh, what I've described until now. It's computationally very expensive. Because if you look at that equation, what am I doing? I'm trying out every shift tau, and for every shift tau, I'm computing this expression. Right? So this is going to be computationally too expensive to really do, uh, because the value of tau that you may have to try could be, could, there could be several values. So how can I make this efficient? The idea here we borrowed from factor stationary signal analysis, right? So the idea is instead of looking at this in the time domain with that shift, the psychic autocorrelation function that I just defined can be represented in using an equivalent expression called the spectral correlation function. Uh, this is essentially looking at the same problem in the frequency domain. And it's defined essentially as the psychic autocorrelation function, but take kind of the Fourier transform of that for all values of that star. Uh, shift uh, that's a power from minus infinity to infinity. The other nice, so this is kind of the spectral correlation function for Wi-Fi. Here now I have two two axes, but instead of tau, I have that frequency, and I have that pattern frequency alpha. The nice thing about this is that you can show that this is essentially uh, the FFT of the original signal, that X of N that you're receiving, just uh, kind of come together at different shifts. So you, you have an SFT and you take the same SFT but shift it by some fixed frequency alpha, which is the pattern frequency, and you just sum it up. And this is much more efficient to compute because SFTs typically, there are accelerators in your hardware to compute the SFTs of windows of samples. And this particular operation uh, where you sum over a particular window L is fairly easy to compute. And you can vary that L to kind of get different levels of robustness uh, to calculate this SFT. So this is what we use. Instead of using the cyclic autocorrelation function, we use this uh, SPF to calculate the feature vector. Now, one important point to note is that you don't need to compute this SPF at all values of frequency and all, all values of pattern frequency. So what you can imagine doing is you know the universe of signal types that you would like to detect. Right? You know, for example, that you want to detect a Wi-Fi, a Zigbee, microwave oven, and a Bluetooth signal. And you kind of can know in advance what pattern frequencies and what frequencies at which these signals will show P. So instead of uh, evaluating this SCF at all values, you can just pick a certain set of pattern frequencies and a certain set of frequencies at which you will calculate this SCF function. And in practice, in our, in our experiments, we found experimentally that you need around 94 different points to calculate this, uh, to, at which you need to calculate this SCF. So we essentially have a 94 length feature vector which are essentially different points in this two-dimensional uh, space, and that, that's the entire feature vector. So you don't have to compute this function everywhere. So once you have this, then it becomes easy to kind of uh, classify. So I won't talk about the classification step in detail in this talk because I have to get through the rest of the uh, system. But in the paper, we kind of describe how you could use uh, SVMs to classify different signal types, assuming you have this uh, 90, 90, 94 length feature vector. And you can, there, there are certain issues regarding how do you make this classification robust if there are multiple interfaces, because then your feature vector will be populated by components from two different signals. And we talk about techniques that allow you to even distinguish multiple interfering signals at the same time. So I'll switch gears. I'll now talk about, okay, I have a feature vector. I know what signal type it is. How do I estimate the spectrum of frequency? So the idea is we express the same intuition, right? So communication signals, again, our sequence is used typically of periodic pulses. So here's a very simplified signal. You have some uh, uh, 
signal that you're sending, and usually it's kind of a, a sent as a pulse, such as a plus sign that's being repeated at some some interval S T. So you have a bit sequence, and if you're sending amplitude modulated pulses, then you're just sending that uh, plus sign, but modulating the amplitude. So that that, that final part itself is that repeating pattern. And if you modulate it by the carrier wave, then it's of course uh, getting out converted to the carrier wave. So these pulses essentially are patterns now, right? So they are embedded within the signal, and this repeats at a frequency that's proportional to the bandwidth you're using, right? So for example, in this very simplified example, that D cos 2 pi F D G F D is the bandwidth. That's the baseband bandwidth that you're using. And the rate at which this pattern repeats is actually related to F P, uh, how or what is the value of F P. So when you compute your future vector, uh, some of the components of that feature vector essentially encode what is the bandwidth that is being used to kind of send the signal out. So these frequencies at which these patterns repeat, this particular pattern repeat tells us the bandwidth of P and often even the carrier frequency of the signal itself. So let me make one comment about the carrier frequency. So remember we have kind of capturing the entire 100 megahertz of bandwidth, right, from the ISM band. So when I say carrier frequency, I do not mean that we are digitizing the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. Uh, we don't have ADCs that can do that. So we are of course converting it to the baseband analog, but we are digitizing the entire 100 megahertz of bandwidth. But different interferers will be at different relative shifts in this 100 megahertz of bandwidth. So Wi-Fi might be occupying channel one, and Zigbee might be occupying the other end of that 100 megahertz band. So even at your baseband that you've captured, you will have some carrier frequency components uh, relative to 2.45 gigahertz. And when I say carrier frequency FP, this is what I mean. I'm, cal I'm calculating that offset of FP with respect to 2.45 gigahertz uh, from this expression. So as I was saying earlier, because these patterns repeat, there are natural components of that feature vector, some of them, some of the components. And here, for example, there's a big B signal, and that's the corresponding spectral correlation function. And you find empirically, kind of, for different signal types, the following relationships. For Wi-Fi, if you look at pattern frequencies between a particular range, that tells you what is the kind of carrier frequency and bandwidth. And similarly, for Bluetooth and ZigBee, you will see peaks at a particular uh, pattern frequencies that are again functions of their carrier frequency and bandwidth. So I won't go into the algorithm here, but you can use these relationships to kind of design an algorithm that allows you to compute both FP as well as the bandwidth of that signal. So we implemented this, and as I was saying, the last last step is the spatial angular arrival computation. Uh, I uh, skipped that part too, but uh, just to kind of wrap this part of the talk up. So we have implemented this. Uh, this was built on essentially a modified channel sounder. So channel sounders are these uh, pieces of equipment that people use to kind of survey uh, where to deploy cellular wireless networks. So we have a two channel sounders are at Stanford that kind of have a very wide front end bandwidth. Uh, they can capture the entire 100 megahertz band, spanning the entire ISM band. And this radio receiver is kind of placed at different locations inside our department building. And these raw digital samples are collected, but they are processed offline on a PC with these Intel Core, uh, in an, on an Intel Core PC. So these are just the sensing devices. We place interferers at different locations in this uh, environment, and we are collecting those raw RQ samples to kind of uh, figure out uh, how well the system works. So here's uh, one of the experiments. So here's how, this is the experimental setup. You have a single interfering radio that we have placed randomly in this office environment. And that location is being varied. The sensors are placed at three different locations, but the location of the interferer is being varied. And we are calculating the SNR of that signal as the sensing radio. And this SNR is being plotted on the x-axis, and the y-axis is the accuracy, right? So the CDF of the axis. The technique we are comparing against is a system called RF jump. Uh, this was a prior technique that was published a couple of years back. And the way to think of RF jump is it's a system that's using energy and as well as timing patterns in the signal that are being received to detect what signal type is. For example, Wi-Fi has this timing pattern that after a large data packet, within 16 microseconds, you'll see a short hat packet. So what the system RF jump does is it measures energy and if it sees gaps of 16 microseconds, it kind of guesses that it's Wi-Fi. So that's how kind of that technique works. As you can imagine, this technique is very, very sensitive 
to energy dense mechanisms and that does not work very well when the SNR is small. So when the SNR is low around 3 dB or so uh, RF dump really fails because it cannot really tell whether there is a signal present or whether it is just not there is too much variance in that system. So we at but on the other hand because DOS is kind of using these cyclic features these cyclostationary features it is integrating over a much longer period and it is uh, essentially that integration step is filtering out a lot of the noise that you might see and therefore it is very accurate even when the SNRs are low as low as 0 dB. So it is 85 percent accurate even when we saw SNRs of that interfering signal as low as 0 dB. Uh, now I am switching gears to kind of multiple signals. So instead of one interferer there are up to three interferers and what is the kind of uh, accuracy uh, in, of the earth in that setting. So just a note the uh, prior technique that RF term technique will not even work in this scenario because it is trying to measure raw energy right. But if you have multiple interferers the raw energy has no meaning because it is the sum of the energies of all of those interferers. So the accuracy of that system was fairly bad actually so we do not show those results. Here we are only plotting the results of DOF for different numbers of interfering signals and what is the probability of missed classification. So think of this as a false uh, negative property. So we can class as you can see DOF kind of classifies all component signals with very high accuracy around 80 percent accuracy even when there are three interfering signals. So uh, as expected kind of as you add more interference the problem the false uh, negative rate uh, goes higher. And the reason really is uh, it gets harder and harder to distinguish uh, if there are three interfering signals and one of them is very weak and two of them are very strong. On the feature vector space the weak signal might not show up because the receivers that you are using have uh, limited dynamic range. So those very weak signals might even get lost in the quantization noise of the ADC itself. So you start seeing these effects where sometimes you cannot detect all the interfering signals. but Nonetheless, we believe that DOS is quite robust even when there are multiple interferences. And finally, just uh, wrapping this part up so, how well does the spectrum occupancy calculation work? Here again on the x axis, I am plotting the normalized error and the y axis is kind of the CDF of this error. And I am comparing against a system called Jello. Uh, this is again a two year old system. And the way this system works is it takes the received signal, computes the power spectral density of that received signal and tries to detect edges in this power spectral density and those edges essentially kind of uh, are boundaries of what spectrum is being occupied by a signal and it uses that to calculate what spectrum is being occupied in the size and that. So this tends to be again sensitive to the SNR right. So if you have a very weak signal at your sense at the at your receiver then that edge detection algorithm gets much more sensitive to noise because it is hard to distinguish between the signal and the noise. But DOS is obviously not using energy itself it is actually using the feature vectors to kind of detect it. So it achieves much higher accuracy uh, even when there are multiple interference signals. So just to wrap this up so this is kind of the information plane. So this is the substrate on which we want to build this coexistence protocol. And the key inside the one takeaway you should have even if you do not see follow anything else is that we are trying to exploit repeating patterns that exist in man made signals to kind of uh, infer all of this information what signal type it is, what spectral occupancy it is, what are the interferers, as well as what spatial directions are the signals are coming at. And one last point I would like to make about this part is this there's a there's a there's an area of research in my group which kind of has the philosophy that the RF in neighborhood around you, all the RF signals that, that are around you kind of encode a lot of information uh, and in this one we are using that information to kind of uh, find out what interference exists and what spectrum is being used. But you can imagine using this for a number of other things you can imagine using this for localization right if I could tell for example what angle an interfering signal is coming at I can imagine combining it with uh, triangulation techniques to localize the interfering data. And in fact we have a paper this year that just got published which is talking about how you can use such RF signal processing techniques in the sub meter accuracy indoor localization system. Or you can imagine even using such systems to do mapping right. So because you kind of know how this frequency works 2.45 gigahertz you can see. You can use this more in a radar system kind of setup where you can map what the neighborhood around 
around you as well. So I won't talk about that stuff, but uh, on my web page and in my group's webpage, page, there are a number of papers that kind of take this theme of how do I take raw RF information and use that to discover my environment around me and uh, do things like localization and mapping. So that wraps it up. So this is the information plane. And now the next step is, okay, I, I have all this information about my neighborhood. How can I actually use this knowledge to exploit all that fragmented spectrum? So if you take that, remember that page that earlier slide back, we had this problem that all of these indicating radios are using different spectrum fragments, and you want to use whatever spectrum is remaining to build a high capacity network. So here I'm switching there to this uh, radio design. So we believe that to do this, to kind of exploit all this fragmented spectrum, you need a new radio itself. Uh, existing radios are incapable of actually exploiting this fragmented spectrum. So let's see why. Right? So let's see why you need a new radio, right? So let's take a Wi-Fi AP, and let's say there's a laptop with a Wi-Fi plant. And one assumption I'll make is that it's going to be a non-starter to design anything which would require you to change all the Wi-Fi chips in the world. So there are billions of laptops and phones that are already sold with Wi-Fi chips. And one constraint we place on our system is we should be interoperable with those systems. So the only thing I'll allow you to change is the Wi-Fi AP. I won't allow you to kind of touch uh, the client itself, the phone itself. So how would you do that? And how would you, if that's the constraint, how would you leverage the fragment system? So this is a standard uh, operation of a Wi-Fi AP right now. It would pick one of these spectrum fragments, one 20 megahertz channel, for example, and use that to operate the AP itself. Now, there's all this other spectrum, right? So uh, there have been many techniques proposed which kind of talk about using OFTM, but uh, as the fact that there are many subcarriers, but zeroing out the subcarriers that correspond to the Zigbee and the Wi-Fi interface. So that way you could stitch all of the spectrum together. But as I said, this would require that you change also all the Wi-Fi clients. And uh, that, that does not, that's not deployable. It's just very hard to kind of convince everyone to change their Wi-Fi chips off of this feature. So this will not work with a legacy 811.5 copy. So one other idea could be, instead of trying to use all this fragmented spectrum to service only a single client, typically a Wi-Fi network has multiple clients associated with it. So why not allow, use different fragments for different clients, right? So in this case, there are three different Wi-Fi clients. And we'll use the first fragment for the first client, the second fragment for the second client, the third fragment for the third client. So this way you get all the benefits, right? So one, each of those clients itself is operating on a contiguous piece of spectrum. So it should be compatible with the legacy file. And you still stitch together all of the spectrum at the AP, so you get a higher capacity network itself. But the challenge with this is that because each of these clients are running independent five MAC protocols, the Wi-Fi AP now has to be able to transmit and receive simultaneously on all of these different spectrum fragments. So it could be transmitting on the first fragment, the blue fragment, while receiving on the purple fragment, and transmitting on the green fragment. So you have two transmissions and one reception on different pieces of spectrum. And depending on how CSMA works, you cannot predict uh, which fragments you'll be transmitting on and which fragments you'll be receiving. So you need this capability if you want to leverage fragmented spectrum to be able to independently transmit and receive simultaneously on all of these different spectrum factors. So one other approach could be, instead of deploying one AP, why not deploy three AP? Right? And configure each AP to kind of work on each spectrum fragment, separate spectrum fragment. And then you don't have this issue because essentially you're running three independent bar fragments. Uh, the challenge, as you can imagine, is uh, how many APs are you going to deploy, right? So Building multiple channel AP is already a hard problem, and if you have to deploy multiple APs with multiple different antennas, then it starts to get out of hand. So one goal we have is to have this capability to transfer and receive simultaneously over these arbitrary paths with a single antenna, with a single radio. I want to use a single AP, a single radio, and a single antenna, and yet allow you to transfer and receive simultaneously on all of these paths. This is kind of the abstraction we so what's really going on? So let's dive deep inside that AP and look at what's really going on, right? So here's the system. So let's say there's a single antenna and you have your radio with a DAC and an ADC. And what I want ideally from this radio is that there are three independent Wi-Fi instances, 
uh, Wi-Fi 1 to Wi-Fi 3 that are operating on top. And by Wi-Fi instances, I mean the physical layer and the map layer, the OSTM uh, physical layer and the CSNA map layer. And they essentially end up, even though it's a single physical radio, they have this abstraction. They think virtually that there are three different radios that are servicing it. So they will send and receive signals, but those signals kind of get go over a single physical radio, go out over the air, uh, or get received from the air over a single physical radio. And the system we have built is the system Picasso that's sitting between these Wi-Fi instances and the physical radio itself. And it's kind of virtualizing the radio front end and makes these Wi-Fi instances believe that essentially there are three separate radios that are servicing them, even though there's a single physical radio. So what do we mean by this virtualization of this, of this independent operation? So one, we want to ensure that this scenario works, right? So if there are two Wi-Fi instances who both decide to transmit at the same time, that should be fine. This is okay. In practice, uh, this, this is easier, relatively easier to do. So even if you're sending two signals at the same time, you can combine them at the baseband level and the analog level and send it out. The other instance is, of course, two receivers. Even that turns out to be relatively easier. Uh, there are some issues with AGC, how do you set the gain on the radio? But regardless, you can still kind of receive two signals. That's usually not the hardest problem. The hardest problem, as you can guess by now, is if one radio decides to transmit and the other radio, other Wi-Fi instance decides to receive. So you're doing a simultaneous transmission and a simultaneous reception on different spectrum fragments. That's hard, and that is not possible with current radios. So why is that? So let's look at a single transmit chain. Right? So you have a digital to analog converter, and that analog signal is coming out of your antenna. And let's say on the x axis kind of is a spectrum, right? So the blue signal is the transmitted spectrum. So that's the spectrum you're using for transmitting a signal. And typically, Wi Fi is sending signals at 20 dBm, and the noise floor is minus 90 dB. So the difference between the transmit power and the noise floor is up to 110 dB. So that it, the transmitted signal can be 110 dB stronger. So on the receiver, you might be receiving this very green, very weak green signal at the same time. So you have a strong interferer on one band, and on an adjacent band, you have this very weak received signal. The challenge is that such strong interference will swamp your ADC. So your ADC does not have enough dynamic change. It does not have enough bits to kind of represent both signals with full fidelity. So this is a known problem, right? This is not a new problem. LT solves this. And the, typically the way you solve this is you put a filter in analog, right? So just after the antenna, you put a filter that filters out all that transmitted self-interference and only allows the received green signal to go through. And then you're fine because the interference is gone. There's enough dynamic change in your ADC and the received signal can get through. The challenge, however, in our scenario is that you do not know in advance which band you're going to transfer down and which band you're going to receive on. So if I just do the flip, right? So instead of transferring on that band, I receive on that band and transfer on the other band. The same filter that I designed in analog for that earlier scenario does not work because it will now let all the interference through and it will filter on the receive signal. And one kind of important point to remember is that it's very hard to design programmable filters in analog. Analog filters tend to be static. And programmable filters, very uh, sharp programmable analog filters are essentially impossible uh, to design. So you can't really have a filter that just shifts depending on what bandwidth you're receiving at that dynamically shift. One other approach is, of course, to let everything through, that entire 100 megahertz bandwidth through, but then this, we are not solved anything because the transmitted signal is very strong and it saturates, uh, saturates the receiver. So the key important point to remember is that fixed analog filters cannot work because spectrum fragmentation patterns vary in space and time. So here's the point about receiver saturation. What do I mean by receiver saturation? You have a strong self-interference and you have this very weak received signal, right? And the ADC has a few bits. Typical Wi-Fi ADCs are at best at 12 bits of ADC. Right? So you can go from up to two to the power of 12 signal level. That might, that's the chopping level on your signal. But if the self-interference is very strong, then when it goes to the ADC and gets digitized, the received signal can get completely zeroed out because there's just not enough resolution in the ADC to capture a very strong signal and a very weak signal simultaneously. So what have we done? So our key insight is the following. To solve this problem, what we say is that 
instead of trying to filter this self interference, cancel it in the time domain. So you have a transmitted self interference, get a small copy of it and cancel it and reduce the strength of that self interference as much as possible. And now if you reduce that self interference signal as you look on the left, that is now comparable to the analog receive signal level. And that's okay, after I amplify it to a low noise amplifier like an LNA, then both signals will kind of look of similar strength. And once you pass that through an ADC, you can get full fidelity recovery of both the self interference and the receive signal. And remember in our problem, the self interference is on a different band from the receive signal. And digital filters are much more programmable, are much more tunable, right? So now it becomes a easier problem. I can just filter out that residual self interference, get the clean receive signal through and decode it. So what I need to make sure is that I have enough self interference cancellation that I can get my receive signal through without any distortion. So how much cancellation do you need to prevent receiver saturation? How should I think about this problem? So here's my receiver and typical Wi-Fi thermal noise source is on the order of minus 90 dBm. It's a very, very weak signal. Now, my ADC on Wi-Fi is 12 bits. Uh, 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 the newer chips that are coming out have 12 bits of ADC. And 12 bits of ADC essentially means a dynamic range of 74 dB. So starting from minus 90 dBm, the strongest signal I can capture is around minus 16 dB. Uh, that's the strongest signal I can capture. Any signal below it, I should be able to capture. But my transmitted signal is 30 dBm, right? It's, uh, and the reason it's 30 dBm is because we are using OFTM, and OFTM has a high peak to average power ratio. So even though the average power might be 20 dBm, uh, instantaneously the signal you're putting out might be as high as 30 dBm itself. So, and on the other hand, the weakest signal that I might be receiving that I expect to decode has 5 dB SNR. So the signal will be at minus 85 dB. Right? So this is the lowest bit rate for Wi-Fi. So to prevent saturation, what I need to do is to ensure that the self interference, which is at most 30, at about 30 dB, gets below the dynamic range of that ADC, gets below that minus 60 dB in threshold. And I just left some 10 dB margin there so that I don't uh, get temporarily saturated. So the minimum analog cancellation you need is around 54 dB. You need to cancel your self interference by at least 54 dB for this to work, for me to receive my received signal without any saturation. So, sorry, for that there's a typo there. For 12 bit ADP, you require approximately 54 dB of wide band analog cancellation. You need to achieve this much cancellation over the entire 100 megahertz band. So here's uh, what we have designed. So this is our cancellation circuit, and this also is related to the earlier full duplex box, and I'll make that connection in a little bit. So we have a trans PX RF front end and an RX RF front end, and we have designed an analog cancellation circuit that sits after the R amplifier and before the LNA on the receive side. There is a single antenna. We are not using multiple antennas, unlike earlier full duplex designs. There's a single antenna, and all of this circuitry is built using off-the-shelf components. And I'll talk about how you design the circuit as well as how you tune it to cancel the self interference. So the T, that, that red signal T is the transmitted signal, that's the self interference. It's going through this component called a circulator. A circulator is a three port device. And what a circulator does is it uh, gives you some isolation between port one and port three. So on port two, you have the antenna over which the signal is going out. So the circulator takes the signal input on port one, which is T here and routes it to the antenna, and the antenna transmits the signal. But circulators are not perfect, they leak, a, they leak a lot of interference. So a lot of that signal energy in T kind of leaks out to the receive part. And typically circulators only give you 15 dB of isolation. What that means is on the receive signal, when you look at that AT term, that self interference, that AT is only 15 dB weaker uh, than the transmitted signal power. And uh, I'm transmitting at 30 dB, and so even the attenuated leak, leak self interference is still at 15 dBm, which is much stronger uh, than the dynamic range of my ADC. So, at this point, right, so I have this circulator, I have a single antenna, I have this leaking self interference, and now I need to kind of cancel it on the receive path. And as this picture kind of shows, I'm getting the copy of the signal, and 
and ideally essentially trying to invert it and subtract it from the received signal. Now, if you take a step back and think about this problem, this seems easy, right? What's the big deal? I'm essentially implementing a subtraction, whether it's in analog or in digital. Why can't I do this? The challenge is that radios are not really linear kind of systems, right? So here is a very simple experiment we did. The signal I'm sending is a much simpler signal. It's not even a Wi-Fi or team signal. It's just sending two sinusoids at two neighboring frequencies. It's just two tones. And if your radio is behaving well, what would you expect? You would expect that this signal just shows up at the antenna exactly like you sent it, those two tones. In practice, what you see is the signal on the right. You see the original two tones, but you see a whole load of other stuff. You see a whole load of harmonics at multiples of those two tone frequencies. And you see all this transmitter noise. This noise is generated by active components like power amplifiers, mixers, and so on. So there's this non-linear effect plus noise that transmitters introduce. And when you talk about cancellation, then you kind of have to cancel transmitter noise as well as all of this harmonics, at least to the level of 54 dB. So that's why this problem is hard. Uh, the, the takeaway point here is that even though you think you know what you're transmitting at baseband, what is actually going out in analog or RF is much different compared to what you think you're transmitting. Uh, any cancellation system kind of has to model all this non-linearity, has to model all this noise and capture it to implement cancellation. So let me talk about the cancellation design. So as I said, there's a circulator connecting to the single antenna and that's giving you around 15 dB of isolation. It's reducing your self interference by 15 dB. Uh, what we do is we couple off a small signal and pass it through this cancellation circuit. And the cancellation circuit is essentially a parallel set of delays six delays, D1 to Dn, and each of those delay tasks has N attenuations. And these attenuators are programmable. You can pick what gain you apply on this attenuation. And you're summing it back up and subtracting it. And there's also a control algorithm to kind of tune how you, what attenuation values you pick uh, to, to, to shape this uh, uh, sample signal to cancel the self interference. So in some sense, what this cancellation circuit is doing is it's trying to shape that copy of that signal C to match the self interference AT that's coming on the receive path and subtract it as much as possible. So how do I think about this problem? So in some sense, this is a multi-tap filter. So you have N delay attenuation branches and here's the intuition behind that. So I'm gonna write it on the time axis as if they're impulses and your self interference signal that's coming over the leaked path from the circulator is one impulse. Let's say it's in the middle somewhere. The way you pick your delays is that you'd straddle that self interference signal. You'll pick one low delay and one high delay, such that one of the delays is lower than the delay of the self interference, and one of the delay pairs is higher than the delay of the self interference. The next pair of delays, you'd straddle both the self interference as well as the first pair of delays. So you'd essentially kind of uh, pick delays that kind of have delays around the actual delay of the self interference signal. And if I step back and think about this, what I'm essentially doing in analog is getting copies of my signal that's being transmitted at different time instants. And in some sense, what the circuit is trying to do is like take these samples, take these copies and interpolate what that interference signal looks like in the middle, right? So it's essentially like a sampling problem uh, where you have different samples of that signal at periodic instants. And that if you have enough samples and at enough rate, then you can always interpolate what the signal looks like in, at, at, at any intermediate point. Sorry, this might be repeated. So how would I do this, right? So let's take, let, let's look at this problem. So the red impulse is your self interference and there are two kind of uh, uh, delay paths whose, uh, whose attenuation you can control. So how do I fix this attenuation? The classic idea is to do sync interpolation, right? So, uh, so this, what you would do is you put a sync around that impulse. So one of the slides got uh, skipped unfortunately, sorry about that. But take the second delay pair, put a sink around it, and see where it intersects with that red interference. And that red, what that intersection point is essentially giving you the values of the attenuation you need to put on that attenuator. Uh, first two yellow delay lines. So you're putting sinks on each delay and seeing where it intersects with the self-interference signal. And that intersection point is telling you what attenuation value to use 
or that delay path. One other important point is this intuition is also telling you what polarity your signal should have. The first pair of delays have positive polarity, the second pair of delays has negative polarity, and so on. As well as it tells you what is the range of attenuation you need to put on different delay paths. So this stuff is all kind of seems easy conceptually, but the big takeaway here is that this allows you to design circuits that are much more compact. Uh, if you can design circuits that do not need to have a large attenuation range, then you can reduce the size of these circuits significantly. So this is the kind of the main intuition. You kind of think think of the circuit design problem as a sampling problem, and you're tuning it to kind of achieve the best analog translation. So here's the circuit we built. This is a board we designed ourselves, and there are all these different delay paths with multiple taps, and uh, this kind of fits plugs into an existing Wi-Fi radio or any other radio that you have. So there's one port for the transmit power amplifier, and the other port is for the receiver. And there's one port for the circulator. This is the antenna uh, port itself. I'm, I'm going to skip a little bit, so I think I'm running out of time. But this is kind of the calculation circuit design. And there's also a control algorithm that's tuning how to pick these attenuators as the self interference is changing, uh, changing with time, with temperature, and so on. So, one question I said earlier was that this also applies to in band full flex. So for in-band full duplex, you need to do both analog cancellation and digital cancellation to get full self-independent cancellation. For the application I'm talking about, I don't need to do that because I only need to do analog cancellation to ensure that there is no saturation in the receiver. As on baseband, I can just do digital cell cancellation. For in-band full duplex, I need to do all digital interference cancellation. So here are results of this system. So here I'm actually showing you results for the entire cancellation, both analog and digital. And this is uh, 80 megahertz of bandwidth. This is the entire ISM bank. This is the widest signal you could transmit using Wi-Fi, for example. And it's sending an 80 megahertz Wi-Fi OCN waveform at 20 dBm transmit power at this frequency. And the blue signal is the signal you're transmitting. It's around 20 dBm. The red signal is the residual self-interference after analog cancellation. And the black signal is after digital cancellation. So as you can see, we get around 62 dB of analog cancellation and another 48 dB of digital cancellation for a total cancellation of 110 dB. So that's a really large number. Uh, 110 dB is obviously 11 orders of magnitude here. And just to give you a sense of uh, the problem itself, let's compare against some other design. So here I'm comparing against uh, one of our earlier designs called the Balin design. So this was our earlier full duplex work. And here we have two antennas that was using some earlier analog cancellation and digital cancellation algorithm. And the other is the Rice design. This is the purple curve. Uh, this is a design from the Rice University group about using designing analog cancellation and full duplex system. And there are two graphs here. Uh, on the x axis on both of these graphs is the transmit power. And the y axis on the first graph is the amount of cancellation we get. And the y axis on the second graph is the residual self indifference. How much is am I hitting my noise floor bar? So one way to think about this problem is if I do not completely eliminate my self indifference, I'm going to add noise to my receive signal. And if I add too much noise to my receive signal, then full duplex is useless, right? Because if I increase my noise by 10 dB, then it does no use if I'm receiving a signal of 10 dB SNR uh, without full duplex. I'm essentially completely saturated, uh, uh, destroying the SNR of that receiver. So as you can see with this new design, we can now completely eliminate self interference to the noise floor. So I, we believe this is the first ever demonstration of a full duplex system that shows that you can design a Wi-Fi full duplex radio without any loss of performance using a single antenna for the widest bandwidth. So you can double capacity on Wi-Fi without requiring extra antenna. You use the same number of antennas as before, and you do not hit the received noise floor in any way. Uh, the earlier designs could hit your increase your noise floor by as much as 20 to 25 dB. And at that point, it just becomes, it makes no sense to use the full duplex approach because then your receive signal is getting completely swamped um, by, uh, uh, by the residual self So let me just wrap this part up. So remember, uh, that was inbound full duplex, but what we were talking about was adaptive FTD, where we were trying to use different spectrum fragments. And there we only need the analog cancellation key. So once I do that analog cancellation, I reduce both signals. I can now get those signals through my ADC and then pass it through a filter engine, a digital filter engine that kind of filters out that transmitted signal because it's in a different band. 
uh, shift the receive band to the sensor frequency and gives it to the independent Wi-Fi PyMap instances uh, that are waiting for it. So let's put it all together. Here's the self-filtering translation circuit. Then there's the digital filtering and the programmable filtering elements as well. And on top of that, are setting all these Wi-Fi instances that are working off the strip. Let me just uh, get to the evaluation. So let me just show you one evaluation number. So remember, we started with this example that I want a single Wi-Fi AD with a single radio and antenna to be able to uh, run multiple Wi-Fi instances. So here I'm kind of doing the extreme case. I have a single AP that's Picasso AP that's going to service four different Wi-Fi clients simultaneously. And I'll compare it against the setup where there are four different Wi-Fi APs, each configured statically to run on these independent channels. So this is kind of the best case scenario, right? So uh, our system should kind of approximate the performance of this uh, best case scenario. So here's the throughput numbers. This is a CDF of the aggregate file layer throughput. And the red curve is Picasso. This is the system we designed. And the blue curve is kind of legacy radio. And uh, this would be when you deploy multiple APs. And the green curve is when there's a single radio. So this is a legacy radio which can only use one channel fragment at a time. So as you can see, our AP kind of gets you that 4x throughput increase because there are four different streams. And it's very close to that idealized multiple legacy radio kind of deployment. You get almost the same throughput. Uh, at very high throughput, there's some loss because uh, there might be other noise or some noise still left over that's reducing the performance at very high level. But we are fairly close to that multiple legacy radio scenario. Yes, sir. Uh, one last point. So I've kind of talked about this in this entire talk about unlicensed spectrum, but this problem is also apparent in licensed time. So here is the 700 megahertz band. This is where LTE is being deployed in the US. And it's very fragmented, right? So AT&T owns a few chunks. Qualcomm owns one chunk in between. Verizon owns a few chunks. And then there's public safety. Band. And these bands are typically FTD. So uh, there's one uplink frequency and there's one downlink frequency. And they have to operate simultaneously. So the way they do this is by essentially putting a filter, analog filter, for every frequency pair that they need to support. This is kind of what a phone is kind of essentially going to look like in two years. They need to have around 10 to 15 different analog filters because there are so many different bands that a phone needs to support. And this is also the reason, for example, your AT&T iPhone cannot work on a Verizon uh, LTE spectrum. They, the iPhone does not have filters for Verizon's bands. It only has filters for AT&T's bands or vice versa. You can't buy a phone for AT&T and expect it to work on Verizon and vice versa. Because of this specificity, you don't have space to put all these filters. So one way you could use the technology we just developed is instead of trying to filter all of this problem, so the problem is exactly the same. It's still self-interference. You need to be able to isolate the trans receive signal from the transmitter signal on an adjacent path. So instead of filtering, uh, you can do self-interference cancellation like we just described to kind of get that same FTD performance. And instead of having to put so many different filters, just build one chip that has the self-interference cancellation capability and allows you to build a world phone, right? So this phone can use any piece of spectrum that's available without having to have support for it in analog. So let me just conclude. Uh, today I've kind of talked about this problem of coexistence, right? So you have multiple radios that are now being packed together on the same device or in the same neighborhood. And often they have to use adjacent bands or even the same band. And in this problem, in this kind of world, interference is the main uh, property that kind of dictates how well your network performs. And the way we look at our research in general is that instead of kind of trying to filter interference or avoid interference or ignore interference, which has been the typical approach, how can we take a step back and look at approaches to understand the nature of this interference? to model it and, if possible, to cancel it and exploit it instead of the earlier approaches of avoiding and ignoring it. And the two systems I've kind of talked about are one some one piece of that uh, larger research team. They are focused more on the unlicensed front and show you how, if you take this approach of embracing interference and trying to exploit it, you can design much higher throughput, much higher capacity, more robust uh, wireless systems. Uh, thank you for taking the time. I didn't realize this talk was going to get so long. But uh, thank you for staying with me, and I'm happy to take any questions.